Hey, here we are, another day, another opportunity to discover more of Father's heart. How can we not be excited about that? Thank you so much for joining me, uh, for choosing to hit play, watching this video, um, figuring out what this is all about. This is His Word Unveiled, and what we do on His Word Unveiled through these videos is we simply walk through the Word of God, choosing to read with purpose for the sole purpose of knowing the Lord more, of growing in Him and His Spirit, pursuing Him, running hard after Him and choosing to listen, choosing to be changed, to live our lives according to His Word and how He leads us and how He speaks to us, being intimately connected with Him, with His Spirit, united as one with our Creator. And therefore, in everything we do, we are living and breathing and moving in and with purpose. That's how I'm choosing to live. And His Word Unveiled is simply learning and being disciplined to read and to read in that purpose, allowing God to have His way, allowing God to do something in us that we're not just reading to read, but we're reading and we're finding ourselves changed. We're choosing to allow His truth to be soaked into us and truly change our lives, the way we think and see things and live and breathe and move and all of that good stuff, it's all found in Him. So let's just dive in. Let's read and understand that every part of His Word is full of power, it's full of life, it's full of purpose, and we can't limit God in just saying, okay, God, the power in this is just understanding the story. No, there's so much more. It's, yeah, getting it, slowing down, figuring out what's going on and when it's taking place and who does what. But then with that knowledge, laying that foundation and allowing the Spirit to come in and take it, to, to take it deeper, to allow it to be applied to our own personal lives. Allowing Him, giving Him permission, His Spirit, to come in and awaken us to His truth so that it meets us with where we're at. It meets you with where you're at. You could be picking up on something completely different than I do, and that's the power of His Word. That if we are being obedient and choosing to just read, then God's going to show up. God's going to overwhelm. God's going to speak, and He's going to unveil His heart to us. So, again, this is His Word Unveiled. So stoked about today, just because it's another day, another opportunity to learn, to grow, to see God in a new light, in a new way, to just grow closer and closer to His heart. So let's do this. Our reading for today, as we continue um, walking through the Word of God, through this incredible journey of just chapter by chapter, not skipping over anything, reading with purpose. Our reading today, as we're reading through chronologically, is 2 Samuel chapters 8 and 9. So this is the time where you go meet with the Lord. This isn't about this video happening. You're going to hit pause. You're going to sit in the presence of the Lord. And, and choose. I'm challenging you to choose to just read. Don't skip over verses. Don't just skim through, but read. And as you're reading, be pursuing the Lord. Pursue the Lord in your obedience and reading the word and opening yourself up to allow God to speak. You may be reading about, you know, some random dude and the Lord could take your heart somewhere that has nothing to do with that random dude. But that's the power of the word. When we're obedient, God's going to do something. He's going to move. So let's let him move. 2 Samuel chapters 8 and 9. Go do your reading. I'm going to pray and we'll walk this thing through together. Lord, we thank you for, um, for this book, for the power and truth that your word holds. We pray that you take that truth that you have established, that you've spoken, the truth that you are Father, and you allow it to do something in us. You allow it to be soaked in, sucked in to who we are, to the depths of who we are, and that it causes movement. It causes things to happen within us. Lord, we want an encounter with you. We don't want a temporary feel-good moment where we're proud of ourselves for getting in the Word of God. We want an encounter with you, an, an authentic encounter with you that'll last that'll be imprinted, that'll be tattooed upon our hearts, upon our lives and our minds. Father, that's what we want something to happen in this moment to change us. Lord, we're after the stuff that lasts. We're after the eternal things that matter, that hold purpose, that, that hold um, just a real 
passion and peace and, and life. Father, that's what we're after. We're after you because in you, all of those things are. You are all of those things. You are life and you are peace. You are our salvation. You are hope. You are everything we need. So we pray, Father, desperate for those things, desperate for you in our lives to come, to invade, to fill, to satisfy, and to show us the way into more and more of who you are. Unveil your heart to us today as we choose to read your word with purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 8. Let's start up. So as you read through, and that's why I ask that you read through, because for the time's sake, I can't go through every part in this. So we're just going to pull out um, as we see fit. As I read through this, I just, I just love when we're committed to not skipping over, when we're going to read everything out, when we get, you know, um, we get a grasp on really what is going on. And that, again, like I said before, just lays out and saying, God, okay, you have permission now. I did my work and in, in really studying and really you know, meditating on what it's saying. So you take that deeper. You take it further. You apply it to whatever. So in chapter 8, we um, read just about David's success, David's victories, how his kingdom is being strengthened. So it just jumps right into verse one saying that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them and that he took over, he took control of the chief city. And we see jumping into 1 Chronicles 18. That's gonna be our next video, the chapter we read in the very next video after this one. Um, we see in there that this chief city of the Philistines, we see that that is Gath. So we know that um, Gath, by that, if that sounds familiar, if we go back to David and Goliath, Goliath of Gath, um, this is the major chief city of the Philistines. And it says that David won control of this, that, that he, his kingdom, his strength, his honor, his favor, the favor of the Lord and the reverence of the people, that, that he's increasing in all of this, favor and strength. Um, David is being victorious in all that he does that the Lord is with him. So we see he takes over Gath. Then we see in verse 2 he defeats Moab. Um, he measures the line. I mean, it's showing this control that he has power over them, that he lays this line. These people are dying. These people are not. They're living, and they're going to serve me. Um, all of this, just his strength, him just being increased in that strength. The Moabites became servants to David, it says, bringing tribute. We see that at the end of verse 2. Jumping down, um, actually verse 3, then David defeated um, Hadadezer, that is the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his rule at the river. Now this river is um, is talking about the river, uh, you, you, uh, the Euphrates River, which is important. And we read about the Euphrates River. It's a main source of, of all goodness, that it's a very important river and spoken of a lot throughout the Old Testament. So we see that David then um, gains control over Gath, defeats the Moabites, that they are serving David. So they become his servants. And then we see that David defeats Hadadezer. And um, when Hadadezer then is being defeated by David, then we see that the Arameans, we see in verse five, that they come to Hadadezer's rescue. And as they're coming to rescue him, then David is like, uh-uh, you were crumping my style. Coming in on this defeat ain't gonna happen. So that the Arameans then are defeated by David as they come to help Hadadezer. So David's just defeating one after another, Gath and the Moabites, Hadadezer, and then the Arameans who come and even try to come in and help um, how today's there. So we just see one victory after another. In verse six, it says, uh, the Arameans became servants to David, bringing tribute. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. So the Lord is with David and it's showing and people are seeing, the nations are seeing that this is being made known that one after another, victory after victory, that David is seeing that David is living, um, living out. Then it says that David took the shields of gold. We see this in verse seven which were carried by the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Then in verse 9, we read about Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer. So we have Hadadezer, who was fighting against, was having war against um, Toy, king of um, Hadath. Is that right? Hamath. I'm sorry. 
Hamath, Toy, king of Hamath. So Toy and Hadadezer were battling together. When David defeated Hadadezer, then Toy is like, oh, shoot, David just defeated our enemy. So Toy sends his son, Joram, to bless David and give him um, a whole bunch of stuff. We see in verse 10, the end of it, it says, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. Verse 11 then, King David also dedicated these to the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. And these are those nations that he subdued. Verse 12, from Aram and Moab and the sons of Ammon and the Philistines and Amalek and from the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Verse 13 says, so David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000 Arameans in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons in Edom, and all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became servants to David, and the Lord helped David wherever he went. We just see this. God is with him. The favor of the Lord is, is strengthening the kingdom of David. So clear. Incredible. Just again, one after another, victory after victory. Verse 15 says, So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. It's who he is. David held fast to his integrity, um, pursued righteousness, because he stands again knowing that the Lord is righteous, and he sees those who live in righteousness, and that was David. That David was choosing righteousness, he was choosing integrity, he was choosing to have his heart purified and, and cleansed, living uprightly. Um, and we see that in just how he reigned over Israel, being a king of those qualities, of integrity, and, and the Lord was with him, and it was clear through all of his victories. In verse 16, Joab, the son of Zeru Zeruiah, was over the army. So Joab was commander of the army. Jehoshaphat was the recorder then. Zadok and Ahimelech were the priests. Um, Seariah was the secretary. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. So just laying out, okay, David's kingdom is being strengthened. So here are the top people. Here are the main people who are coming in, supporting, working for, and with David, just mentioning those names. And Joab, of course, we've heard about with um, his brothers, Joab and Asahel and um, Abishai. So we heard a little bit about Joab, but he is then the commander of David's army. And this is so important because we'll hear more and more about Joab and um, just how that story carries on with him. So that finishes up chapter eight, just seeing Again, David's victories, how, how he's growing and being strengthened, increasing in honor, and that the Lord was with him. This takes us into chapter 9, um, and this speaks of David too. His, his faithfulness, his commitment, the loyalty that he holds um, to him, to what he's spoken to other people, even when he didn't have to. Um, again, holding fast to his integrity. That's who David was. So chapter 9, verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So going clear back to this incredible friendship that David and Jonathan had, that they made a covenant with each other to treat each other's families with compassion, with loyalty, making a covenant with them that there would be peace between them, that they would, would tend to and care for each other, um, loving each other in this solid friendship, this solid relationship. So, so beautiful. And David remembers that. He doesn't forget that. He remains loyal in what he spoke. And he is inquiring if there is anyone left of the house of Saul that he can show kindness to, that he can help out with. If anyone needs help that is left, that he can care for. Then it mentions this servant of the house of Saul, whose name is Ziba. And David called this servant Ziba. And he is willing to listen to David saying, I am your servant. What do you want anything from me? And David asked him and said, Is there yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? We see this in verse 3. And Ziba said to him, still in verse 3, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Now, if you remember this, this briefly talks about um, Mephibosheth, who they say that when this invasion happened, Mephibosheth, when he was young, um, just a young, young boy, that his servant grabbed him, lifted him up to run, to flee from those who were coming at and attacking, and she had dropped him, and he became lame in his feet. So this is Mephibosheth. Now, um, 
now an, an older man, no longer a child. And Ziba mentions this. There's still the son of Jonathan, crippled in both feet. Verse 4 says, So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel in Lodebar. So Ziba says, Okay, there is a son. He's crippled. He's over here at this place. So David sent for him, brought him then from the house of where he was, brought him into where David was. In verse 6, it says, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. So David treated him with such honor, with such respect, and David did not have to do any of this. He didn't. Jonathan had died. Saul has died. Jonathan is increasing in strength and favor. He's like top dog here. Yet Jonathan refused to be arrogant. He refused to be, to, to go along with wickedness, to be after himself, that he was compassionate. He had his eyes open. He had his heart open and remained faithful remained committed because when you hang out with the Lord, when you're trusting in him, then the character of the Lord, it's we're exposed to that. It it floods down upon us and we we begin acting and responding and treating others the way that God is responding us and what we see and how we see him loving us, forgiving us, showing mercy on us and his loving kindness enduring and flooding and overflowing that we begin treating others and we see this in David. It's beautiful that after so long, Jonathan's long gone, and David is still seeking to honor his friend, to honor his covenant, his commitment that he made to Jonathan. So he treats Mephibosheth with such respect, and he tells Ziba and everyone in Ziba's household that they are to serve uh, Mephibosheth, that they are to give him everything that belonged to Saul, that it is now Mephibosheth's. And David had Mephibosheth sit with him at the table, eating the king's food. Such an honor, such, um, such respect, such loyalty that David is now showing. Um, it says at verse 11, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. In verse 13, so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. So we just see that loyalty again, just who David is and looking after now Jonathan's son, who is lame in his feet, crippled in his feet, named Mephibosheth. So that's that. That's what we're ending with. So we see just David growing in power and strength and also growing in, in just heart and his character and integrity and not losing sight of who he is. No matter how you know popular he's becoming, no matter how much fame he's gaining, no, ma no matter how many victories he's accomplishing and walking in, no matter how great and wealthy and strong and big he's becoming, he is still not losing himself. He is still trusting and relying on the Lord. He's still um, waiting on God. He is still caring for others. He is still holding fast to his integrity and pureness of heart and pursuing after the Lord and his righteousness. So good. Um, David truly being a man after God's own heart. So encouraging to see. Um, love that there are people like that out there who genuinely care and, and are not living for themselves, living for something greater and bigger than themselves. So good. So just understanding that story, that timeline, our next video we're going to hit then is um, First Chronicles 18, which is the... Um, totally connects with 2 Samuel chapter 8 that we just read. So it's going to be a beautiful recap. We're going to go into it more and let God just unveil more and more with us reading it again. We're not going to skip over because we believe that it's put in the word of God twice for a reason, that there's power and purpose in that, and we're going to trust and continue following the Lord in it. So, so good. Thanks for walking this out with me. Um, join me on my next video. Hope to see you then.